Hello, I'm uh, Odin Rickardsen. I'm a nature photographer and a professor in biology, uh, which is um, situated in Tromsø, northern part of Norway. I'm very sorry I can't attend your conference because now I'm out chasing whales uh, up in the north. Um, so this, that's why this had to be a recording. Well, what I'm going to tell you, uh, I will talk about today, is uh, some Arctic stories from my neighborhood. Uh, I'm, um, I don't travel, well I travel a little, but uh, I, I, my photography is a lot um, based on uh, in my local area. Um, so, so that's what I'm going to talk about uh, mainly today. So then you can ask, why do I put up this picture? What is it? So you can start guessing. Um, it's the reason why I put up this. Uh, people think it's ice or anything like that. No, it's not. Uh, it's in fact this. Oh. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, I was challenged by Norwegian TV once uh, to um, they, they made a documentary about me and they asked me to take a picture I, I well take a picture I never thought of taking and the first my first thought was a wedding picture so then I did it my own way but in many way this picture shows uh, um, what I'm quite fascinated about is this little tiny millimeter that divides the two totally different worlds above water and below water and uh, one millimeter can in many ways also mean, have different meanings. Uh, this is the same situation, but with, uh, with another meaning of, of a millimeter's precision. Uh, this was uh, a friend of mine that wanted to, desperately wanted to do it, uh, uh, drive over my camera naked. I'm not going to show you that split picture, but we wanted to do, do a, a practical joke with him so the pole you see there in front of him is to mark where my camera was and it's usually much lower so what I did I, I enlarged it uh, so much that he was about the same height as me so I enlarged it so it should she should barely almost pass it and uh, you can see his expression when he see oh shit <laughs> the, the pole is lo uh, longer and um, it probably was about one millimeter, uh, and uh, there were, I can assure you there was nothing left on the pole when he had passed over. So, uh, but it was uh, it was really fun. Um, this is what I do. I, uh, as I said, I'm a professor in biology. I, I work a lot with salmon. I worked with halibut, and the last ten years I worked with uh, with whales, as you see in the lower part. Um, and I use uh, different kind of electronic tags that I attach to to either the, the salmon or, or the whales. Uh, I also combine my photography with my science. And that gives me a win-win situation because uh, usually I, I know more about the subject I, I take picture of. So I can use that into my picture to take good, better pictures. And I can also use my picture to uh, tell my stories, uh, tell the or public, um, yeah, tell my scientific results if you can say that. So, so in, in many ways, it's uh, and it you know, a good picture sells your story much better than than you know, just text and a, and a scientific paper. So, so that's a huge benefit. Uh, so, I grew up in uh, a coastal community, I grew up. Uh, with my uh, uh, grandfather was a whaler in fact uh, and several of my uncles was fish, uh, fishermen my father which is here was uh, was a teacher but also into fishing so i think most of that is this you know that, that i grew up in this culture and close to the to the sea have shaped both me as a person but also also my photography um, in the northern part of Norway, we are fortunate to have a really great uh, photo photography opportunities. This is from my town where I live now in Tromsø. It's midnight sun. It's uh, you can still go skiing in the midnight sun. 
Um, and you have this, what, what fascinates me about this area is that you have this variation in seasons. Uh, so you can go, you know, from the dark period or and, and to the dark period where you have lights. There's uh, no sun for two months, uh, although the lights that is, it's quite intense. Uh, and so you have this variety. This is, the uh, upper one is, is uh, during summer, the other one is... Uh, is during night, so it's two different seasons, and this is what fascinates me because you can have the same motive, but it's a change through season, uh, and that's uh, something I try to focus on. And 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 it change, you know, the the subject also change, and the light change, and and so that's uh, really really something that that I appreciate with this area. Uh, the thing is that I probably push my borders a little further than many else, and. I, a few years ago, I was asked by Canon uh, to be an um, ambassador, and I, I have to really ask them again, are you sure you're right, asking the right person? Because I have a, a story of, of uh, not being too nice with my cameras, and uh, Canon replied and said, yeah, that's why we want you. We know that. And uh, I, I put my cameras through quite uh, harsh uh, conditions and, and to me it shouldn't be uh, the equipment that is the limit, it should be me that is the limit. So, so, um, but that also of course uh, when I break a camera that's usually not the uh, camera's fault, it's usually my fault. Also of course we, uh, one thing we have these different seasons up in the north but we also have all these nature resources. We have uh, resources in in the ocean and this is my father fishing we have in freshwater this is the arctic char which is the northernmost fish in the world uh, taken on Svalbard on 80 degrees north and we have terrestrial uh, resources here is my mother and my dog uh, eating uh, clawberries and of course we have also great uh, outdoor uh, possibilities go skiing here is me and, and my daughter when she was young she's now five years old and of course you have good fishing opportunities uh, in the rivers uh, this is a big sea trout caught my with my my cousin and uh, my daughter is trying to netting it and of course you have great skiing opportunities and you can do crazy stuff like this. This is my neighborhood and my neighbors and a few crazy friends that uh, that agreed to do this stunt. Uh, I also try to use uh, my neighborhood and and, uh, and my photography seems to be getting uh, closer and closer to my home in many ways. This is just 300 meters from my home. It's a single exposure. I can just, just as I said, none of my pictures are manipulated in any way. So this is a single exposure and I use a special technique uh, where I adjust my focus and the aperture through the exposure of, the, of uh, my picture. So I can get it sharp all from like this is uh, the, the moth is just one and a half centimeter from my, my lens. So I first flashed that and then I refocused and refocused like two, three times and I paint with, with light and then I can end up with a picture of this. So this is taken just a few, uh, few hundred meters from my home and I put out the light to attract moths and, and uh, it was just a bonus on the leaf. You can see there's some, some hearts in the leaf because this, this moth is in fact sitting there waiting for a partner. So it's waiting for love. So you can say. Here are some others. These uh, are also quite uh, quite close to where I live. Um, what I uh, this with the with the jellyfish is is in the same location as the mott more or less. The other uh, with the sea trout you see on on the right side. That's a uh, um, uh, one and a half hour drive. But I know this river intimately, and I also know how to attract the fish. Uh, using a strong light and so on and and eventually it took me three weeks to to get pictures like it and learn the technique how to uh, attract the fish and then I used the same technique where I refocused and and I also adjusted the aperture through the exposure 
So you can in fact see on this picture, you can see three fish. It's the sea trout and there's some small, a couple of juveniles in the picture as well that was a tract. And an interesting thing is that you see when you have flashes in the water, you get uh, kind of the picture mirrored up on the surface. So um, I never do this again because it was really, really difficult to do. Um, of course, then we also have uh, great nature or wildlife right out, uh, outside of my uh, over doors. And this is where I live. So we had the whales coming in here in the winter just for, for five years. And we had the hotspot right outside our window, which was really, really good. Okay, so now I'm gonna, this will be a, a, a video that uh, can make uh, made on me. And it tells a little uh, how I work. The water, you know, this little millimeters that divide those two worlds, above water and below water, is something that really fascinates me. Because I'm both a scientist and a photographer, I like trying the impossible. For example, I've been observing kilowaves attract to fishing boats. What I wanted to have is a split picture where everything is sharp both below and above the surface. That tells both stories. Eventually, after a couple of years building things, I came up with a solution. As a biologist, I've learned that if I can show scientific results through a picture, it has a much bigger impact. This is a great way of telling my stories. It should not be the equipment that is the limit. It should be me that's the limit. I'm looking for moments in nature that you rarely see. And you know sometimes you won't get that chance again. The luck doesn't come by itself, you have to plan for it and make it. You are persistent and you wait you wait until you have the situation where you see everything falls together. And eventually, the luck will come. And it's that moment you have what you have been looking for for weeks or maybe years, it's so incredible. That's the part that drives me, both as a scientist and as a photographer. So I always continue, I never stop. Yes, that uh, tells uh, quite a bit how I take my pictures and, um, and also as I told earlier I, I use my, my um, knowledge as a, as a scientist uh, uh, to approach often the, the animals like this one um, and, and these ones, these are just uh, some uh, returning salmon that returns from from uh, the sea and uh, this these were taken on under a bridge uh, very close to to my home just a few hundred meters from my home again and this was in the same river i i uh, i hiked up the river to see if there was some salmon and then suddenly a frog uh, popped up in fact there was two frogs but one disappeared unfortunately so I use the same technique here and adjust the focus and aperture through the exposure. I also um, try to, to document the wildlife. Uh, this is a, a reindeer and I ask the reindeer owner or herder 
these are free living animals, but uh, I, I needed some advices how to get close to them. And eventually I, I managed to do that with uh, a camera setup and, and uh, I can get pictures like this with reindeer in northern light. I've also been very fascinated about eagles and I built it, uh, in a hide up uh, close to my home so it's about uh, 20 uh, minutes uh, hike which you saw on the on the Canon uh, um, uh, video and these are, are the results and, and after it took me three years to get the eagles adjusted and eventually they were so trusting my cameras that they could you know they were this this eagle is just a few centimeters from the lens it's a fisheye lens so they can sit there and the flash they didn't react to the flash it it's almost seems like they like the flash so you can get pictures like this and 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 this is also this was awarded as the in the wildlife photographer of the year a couple of years ago as the best bird image that year so it's really paid off and patience has really paid off and and the good thing with with doing this in in the my local environment is that you can you can be there at the right moment although of course these are taken in motion sensors but i i had to go up every night and adjust and clean the lenses and so on so so eventually you did it but after the, the eagles left eventually uh, in the spring then they go nesting and i thought of just leaving the camera there and see how long it took for them to leave and i'm really glad i did that because then this black rose turned up just by accident and if he, he used this this um, uh, tree when i had my camera to to charm you know the ladies so we wanted to pick up ladies used there so i got a picture like this and eventually i got this one as well which was probably one of the best one which also won a, a competition so it's sometimes you get surprises but it's it's uh, it's about to you know never stop never give up uh, and and this here you will see another video it's a short clip from uh, a uh, one hour documentary that NRK and Witching TV made of me and it also show how I I try to uh, well I, I do my photography Here come a clip Ja, ja, det kan ju skita. Det är tungt. <laughs> Nej, nu ska jag stå, stå här. Det, det blir mörkt. Ja, ja det, det, det. Du ser både stuken och allt. Ja, vad känner du tufft? Så att tanken är då att det ska hoppa och få en en spackhager föran en fiskebåt som det var ja. drar den här notan med sill. Men gärna att alltså, vi ser folk och fuggel och sånt bakring. Det var för kört att det gjorde att det och in i Jokernoren det här. <laughs>
Det är där, det är där Nicky. Det är där det är perfekt. På väg upp. Oj, 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 oj. Yes. Yes! Woo! Woo! Yes, it's a lot of adrenaline uh, often, and and what what really drives me is uh, is that that moment you realize you have the picture you have been working so hard for, and and not next you know what happened after is if that the picture get awarded or anything is that feeling in that moment you you realize it the adrenaline kick you get then that is really my driving force and and the whole process to get there that's uh, why I, why I am I do this really um, and then um, people say that oh Odin you must have so much luck uh, getting all these pictures and, and getting into these situations well that definitely not the case um, people that knows me can confirm that I have a lot of accidents and and, and mistakes and, but it's all about learning uh, about the mistakes and also never ever give up the hope. And this is uh, what I'm going to show you new, uh, now is uh, an example of that. What you see here is a, a seal breathing hole on Svalbard. And I wanted to get um, a, a seal coming up from the uh, hole uh, and with a motion sensor and get the iceberg and everything in the background. So I put up my my camera there and I waited and uh, unfortunately the camera was unprotected and I was waiting and then uh, in the middle of the night the alarm on the boat uh, went off and someone was shouting polar bear and what happened was that the polar bear instead of going to the boat it went directly to my camera and you can see here and I was there sitting there on the boat about 500 meters away so excited and I knew the camera was unsecured and I was so much hoping that the polar bear would just leave the camera uh, and but then it started to licking and it started this is you know a very short clip of, of uh, several minutes uh, take and then it tipped the motion sensor and I was begging no 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 don't leave the camera no leave the camera and then wow camera went on but I saw that it was still hanging from from the from the cable and I just okay polar bear leave the camera no, I don't care about the camera I care about my memory card and the pictures and then he started to pull up the camera again I can see the camera and the pole. you can see the camera coming up in the tripod and then bang and then the curtains really went down to, to me because I, I knew it was the camera was lost and you can see I was swearing and the polar bear like oh what was that he can, he can hear me scare, uh, screaming so I was so disappointed and that was I was so close getting these amazing pictures and then phew, it sunk down to 150 meters depth in a very very remote area in in Spitsberg. But then uh, it's all about uh, never giving up uh, and, a, and a old professor once uh, one time gave me this uh, drawing and I I, when I walked over to pick up the motion sensors that was still left there, I was still thinking of them. And luckily I brought the GPS, so I took the position of where the camera went down. And in fact, this is a real situation. Uh, and this is a frog trying to be swallowed, or almost being swallowed by, by a stork. So I, I remember this, and I thought, is it possible to, to get that camera up? You know, I, I talked to colleagues and they said, oh, it's, it's insane. You, you should, you know, it will sink into the bottom so close to the glacier. Uh, the camera will corrode the, the memory card because the camera was on the memory card with shortcut. So it really, there is very little chance. But making a long story very short, it ended up me going up one year after putting together a crew and Norwegian TV and then we try to rescue it. And there was a lot of 
difficult on the way. The, the ice was really, really uh, bad. So we almost had to turn. We, uh, we tried several times. We had difficulties with the drone. And this is the, this is the fifth time we're starting to get short time because we have to leave again. And then suddenly. I didn't believe what I was seeing. Yes! So then we tried to get close, but then it stopped, it was entangled, and we started to get error messages. And we were so close, and I thought the drone pilot said that probably the drone is 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 drowned, so it's probably broken. So I thought every hope was so. We were so close. We were touching the camera, but we couldn't get it up. Then we got it up, and we saw. Well, it wasn't probably the drone. It was seaweeds. And we tried again. Put down the drone. We had 15 minutes, uh, yeah. and then we found it again. Yeah. Um, yes, we had it. <laughs> and then we started to pull it up slowly, and we almost lost it twice on the way up. And we were barely losing it, so I had to try to get the camera there. And we got it up. That was the biggest adrenaline kick I ever had. Of course, the camera was gone. We had a memory card, but we couldn't know if we could save the memory cards. I put it in freshwater, called the criminal police in Norway, how they do in cases when they have that, and I was recommended this company. They used two days, and eventually they found the pictures, and when they managed to download it, the, ca the card shortcut it. So this is the result, um, and the whole story made it into National Geographic. Uh, so I, I can tell you this is uh, the, one of the most insane projects I've ever done, and I will never ever do this again, but it again it shows that if you never ever give up and you have a little tiny piece of hope, you might succeed, because if you never give up and you, and you try again and, and again, the luck will eventually come, and that's uh, that's my um, what I often think of how I work. So then, uh, at the end, I will say a little about the, the whale uh, feast that we have had, uh, and this is why I couldn't come. This is where I am now, uh, chasing these whales to do research and some pictures. Uh, it's really we call it the whale uh, feast, but uh, it's really the herring feast because it's the herring that that. Uh, have made all the whales come in, come into the fjords. Uh, I mean, we've had this for now more than 10 years, and it's been changing uh, more northward for every year. Uh, but 
And why this herring comes in, we don't know. They just come in to overwinter, they don't feed, they just stay in the fjords, and that's what attracts the whales. So we had from before the northern light, then we had the whales, and of course this attracts a lot of tourism, both the northern light and, and the whales in the same time. And, and it also changed the whole ecosystem in many ways in this fjord because you get this masses and masses of herring moving into the fjord, followed by other fish, uh, followed by uh, whales, followed by seabirds, and it was like a living organism. And it was like, and fishing was of locals, it was crazy. And it also affected the whole ecosystem. So you can see that uh, when the herring left, they had the effect, for example, you had the eagles where you see here on the picture taking a herring. Those eagles had much better nesting success in the following years. So that was usually a period they, they starved, but they then got a lot of, of extra food. And we also use this as an opportunity to do the research when you haven't right out of, this, uh, of the door. So this is me satellite tagging a humpback whale. And it's, you get the same adrenaline kick often here, uh, as in, in my photography, honestly. This is good conditions, and, and this is condition you can usually get when you have them right outside of your door and in the fjords. That's the tag attached, and this uh, tag is the, in fact stayed on for almost a year before it fell off. Uh, they always uh, fall off, and it you know all this tagging both uh, of, of killer whales and on which is on, on the right side and humpback whales have, have revealed a lot of new uh, information. So it, this is the first time we have been able to follow killer whales from the Arctic from up to 80 uh, uh, two degrees north all the way to the Caribbean. So it's a uh, 10,000 kilometer. Uh, migration and they migrate for half a year without feeding only for one thing sex and also for giving birth so for some reason they they go to the tropical areas to have sex and have fun and and, and give birth and then up again to the north to, to feed and the same with killer whales, we, we found a lot of, of new information on how they were able to follow the herring. We saw that some went north up to the Barents Sea, probably to feed on, on seals, uh, not on herring. So we had a lot of really, really good information on this. And we also use pictures in this for, to document. For example, what you see up in the left corner, we take picture of, of the, the tails. And the tails are like a, a finger mark, so you can identify each individual. And now we have more than 1,000 individuals identified in just this area. Uh, the killer whales, what we also saw, was that they are getting attracted to fishing boats. So they, they seem to get a free meal. They have learned the sound on the fishing boat when they winch the, in the, the, their nets. And they are attracted because they know that there will be a lot of herring half dead swimming around and which they feed so they don't need to use energy uh, by themselves for catching it so they can get it for free. Unfortunately this can also have uh, uh, um, severely consequences uh, like this uh, humpbacks that was entangled in, in some fishing gear. So we have both uh, humpback whales and, and killer whales being at, attached to this. And that's something we are dealing with now to try to reduce these impacts. Unfortunately, it happens that, that uh, whales die. And this was uh, a killer whale that was attached to uh, or drowned in a gillnet and eventually drifted up on land. And I used the opportunity to, uh, to see who was feeding on it. And it turns out to be sea eagles. Um, Unfortunately, this sea eagle, eagle uh, is, is, is probably not a very clever idea for the sea eagle to, to feed on it. Because the, the killer whales has, unfortunately, a world record. And it's the most polluted animal in the world. It's on the very, very far top on the food chain, which means that all the contaminants uh, and toxins aggregate up through the food chain and end up on the top of, of the killer whales, and particularly those that eat uh, mammals. So there is uh, scientific uh, um, models that shows that probably within 
uh, 50 to 100 years, half of the population of world's population of killer whales will be will be gone because of contaminants. Uh, there is also, of course, a really good uh, opportunity for the locals. Here is my father and my, my mother um, watching whales, and this has a story because uh, my father, as you saw in the video earlier, he has only one leg, and when he had to cut his leg, I saw this whale with half a tail uh, just two days before, and I called my father and said, Hello, Dad, I have seen a whale with just half a tail and it seems to be doing fine and I'm sure you will be doing fine and for me that whale has been very special and I've seen it several times before and two years after I managed to get my father on the boat and my mother and I haven't seen that I, I didn't see that uh, whale uh, earlier but like a miracle it turns up right that day and the, the, the whale right in front of the boat is uh, the, that whale. So you can see the expression of my father when he saw that. So the, the thing is with the, um, there's there's a lot of places you, where you can go to uh, to watch whales but there is no place that is so extreme and so exotic that uh, up in the northern, northern fjords. Uh, there's little lights and, and usually the whales comes just before the lights disappear, before the polar night comes and there will be two months without sun. But that little light there is, is so incredible intense. Uh, but it also, of course, uh, give you a lot of, of challenges and how to picture them in this light, uh, low light condition. But if you succeed with that, you will get pictures that is different from anything else. Uh, and these are just before uh, the sun disappears. And then, of course, when the sun disappears, you get a polar night. It's not like the whales stop feeding, they continue to feed through the polar night, like here. And, uh, and uh, I developed, I, I, I tested out different system and I ended up with a system where I could uh, take picture of the whales uh, in dark conditions using a strong torch, a flash and, and some other systems. And I was able to get pictures that are quite different from, I think, m most others. I, I don't think there's anyone else that, that uh, used this on, on whales at night. So it's really, really nice and it's so incredible nice to be out there in the darkness and just listen to where the whales are and try to follow them. And usually there are no other boats there except for fishing boats. Uh, so you can take pictures like this. And uh, this is uh, a dead herring drifting alongside a fishing boats. And this is another killer whale, killer whale uh, uh, that are around the fishing boats at night. And it came up to my camera and I could use a flash to get pictures like this. And I can also use the light from the boats to get pictures like this one. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then I I'll, will show you a little clip. Um, I also know the last years I've been using camera tags, so I've been taking my photography underwater but placing the camera on top of the whale. So this is, uh, you see the whales here and you see gannets and you see lots of birds and that's because there's uh, herring underneath. And we, we attached the cameras with help of the Coast Guard here. We attached uh, the tag on, on which it stays on for a while, maybe uh, one day and it films, uh, films uh, anything that uh, the whale does. So this is, uh, this is just an example of what it looks. So you can see, you, it feels like you're riding on the back of the whale and you can see anything it does. You can see, you get a totally different perspective. You can hear the, no the sound. Here you can also see the gannets, you see the herring where they, uh, they, they uh, they, they pull the herring to get in a ball and then they use the tail to flap uh, to stun the herring and then they go and pick one on one. And you can see here how they cooperate. So it's really really fun uh, to do this and it's, it's like being a whale. It's like being in the water with a whale hanging on the back for hours and hours and you can see and it's so incredible exciting the first time you see it because you never know what you will get. And you could be lucky to get things like this. Um, 
Okay, so then we're getting toward an end, but I'll tell you a little about our little Russian spy we had. Um, you might have heard about this. It uh, some years ago it turned this well turned up in the harbor in a town called a northern town called Hammerfest, uh, and it had a harness on, and we tried to figure out uh, what it was, and eventually we tracked it back to to Russia and to the Murmansk area, and it had been. Uh, trained by the Russian Navy uh, so I was one of the first to um, to be up there and meet him and I'm following him now for two years and he's doing well he's been uh, he's been uh, touring the whole coast of Norway uh, going south and here you can see the the harness that was first on it and when he was in Hammerfest it was a little skinny so they started to feed it and it also became a uh, I show these feeding events because a tourist attraction because in here they were feeding it but they also uh, to to finance this they they uh, they made a show out of it and, and tourists uh, came to, to watch uh, and donate it so eventually he learned to uh, feed by himself and now he's uh, uh, as I see it uh, he's touring uh, touring around um, around uh, Norway at the coast of Norway and, and now he's it, uh, much further south than he was first spotted. He, he seems to love a hatchery uh, of fish farms, so he probably feed around fish farms. So this was one uh, Russian or white whale. Um, then another story about uh, a, a whale, the ghost whale. In 2018 I was up in the Barents Sea tagging whales and uh, we had situation with this where we can see hundreds of whales around and I was lucky also to snorkel with them as probably the first one ever snorkeling in the Barents Sea. But we, during that trip we had a dream to see this ghost whale and we, we wished, you know, but we, we didn't believe it because this ghost whale has seen, been seen only like three, four times before. It's been photographed in long distance only once. Uh, but we hoped to see it and on the way home when we returned I was still sitting up watching, you know, at least for other whales. Uh, but the fog came and the visibility was like 50 uh, meters. We couldn't see any much, so I went down to have dinner. Suddenly the captain uh, was uh, speaking or on the speaker and he said, White whale. And a white whale is uh, the Norwegian name for a beluga. So we thought, okay, okay cool, it was a beluga. I took my camera, run up, and it turns out. When I came up, I saw this. I saw this uh, white, uh, uh, enormous animal underneath the surface, and I immediately saw, "Wow, shit! This can this is not a beluga. This is something else." And it turns out to be the ghost whale. It's the white humpback, and this is one out of two humpbacks in the world. The other one is uh, Migaloo, it has its own name, it's in Australia, it's been seen, spotted uh, thousands of times, but this one, as I said, been spotted very, very few times. And of course, after chasing this whale, and we also got uh, uh, the, the fog disappeared and we went out on the ocean, and I managed to, uh, to get a biopsy of it, and when I got back on the ship, the crew wanted to go back to get a beer on the local pub in Tromsø. So I asked the captain to give, give me one more last chance to get a, some picture of it, because I've been, uh, been trying to get the biopsy, the, the skin sample from this, I couldn't take picture. Okay, he said, like, I give you five minutes. And it went five minutes, and the whale was there, and he started to turn, and he started to turn the boat to go home, and then the miracle happened. It breached like you see here. Uh, and it breached three times, so I was lucky to get uh, all three times and get them sharp. So this is in fact the first breaching humpback whale I have a picture of. So I was extremely happy to get uh, this very very rare one. Okay, so um, now I'm uh, just gonna take you below the surface and you can listen to the this uh, sound you hear here is me that has recorded in a fjord outside my home. It's like Jurassic Park. It's amazing. 
This is the humpbacks. Earlier we thought that the humpbacks were singing only on the mating grounds in the tropical areas. That's not the case. Okay, that was my uh, last picture. I'm, again, I'm sorry I couldn't uh, join you, uh, but I hope you had a, a good time and uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And have a great uh, festival and, or, or conference. Um, so this you can find my pictures uh, on my, my homepage or my Facebook. Uh, I also have a book, but unfortunately that book is uh, only sold in Norway. There is a few uh, bookstores that sell it, so if you contact me, uh, I might give you that. Uh, I can give you that uh, uh, address, and you can try to see if you you want to see more of my pictures. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye bye.